Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Martinez. Uh, I'm representing Arquitectura Spondas. And uh, today uh, we would like to welcome you in our new initiative, Experiments Platform Discussion on Experimentation in Architecture. While still people are, are coming in, in the room, um, I will give a short introduction about uh, Experiments Platform and uh, who helped us to launch it. Of course, uh, in today's spotlight, we will have our distinguished mentors, but uh, they will be presented just in a moment by Augusta. So first of all, um, Experiments Platform was born out of need uh, to think about and make architecture differently beyond design and construction, as we were usually taught. So for this experiment is very valuable world because uh, it experimentation is a process where you have a idea and then uh, time and uh, methods to test it. So it is, it is not uh, about the result, it's more about uh, the general process where through trying and testing, you can learn something new. And uh, this is very crucial because um, self-education itself was uh, a huge part of what Arquitecturas Fondas was doing since 2009, when uh, it started its first initiative of uh, public um, talks and discussion series. And since then, uh, organization has uh, done so many different projects, um, but most of them were uh, bottom-up initiatives uh, focusing on various ways of uh, thinking and doing architecture that is relevant for today's need. So Architecturas Fondas became very um, mature since then, but we still are aiming for this um, uh, vital uh, spirit of flexibility and innovation. Fresh air is in the air and uh, uh, experiments platform is space for this unknown uh, beautiful mess. So we also have to acknowledge that uh, for brave, radical and critical ideas, people still need support. And uh, uh, this support uh, we find in our uh, idea of bringing creatives and experienced creatives to exchange uh, their experiences. And through this mutual collaboration between mentor and mentee, we hope that uh, we will have a really wonderful time in our experimental platform. So. I will not expand so much uh, more on this. Uh, Augusta will give you um, more introduction about how Experiments Platform is going to uh, develop further. But I will just like to mention few, uh, few, few people who are not who, who are not today with us, but they were very crucial in developing this initiative. So. Indra Rusatskaita, who was previously in charge of experimental uh, experiments platform in Architecturas Fondas, uh, helped us to really shape this, uh, this initiative as it is now, together with the advisory board of Architecturas Fondas. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I, I really want to thank you, Augusta, for believing in us and uh, yeah, making this idea into what it is now. So Augusta, uh, I'm passing a word to you and I'm yeah, uh, hoping for a yeah. nice discussion. Thank you, Martina, as far for saying those words. Um, and thank you for giving such a great insight on Experiments Platform Program. Uh, so yeah, I'm Augusta, uh, very nice to meet you all. Uh, so I would like to continue by saying that this initiative is there for you to rethink architecture from the ground up to explore architectural capabilities um, and tools that could help you to expand your questions and investigate your research. 
And, you know, it is there to explore the relationship between architecture and the rest of the world that surrounds us. And whether it is a very pre uh, present or environmental topic, or is it um, the analysis of combination of architecture and performance, for instance, we believe that architecture and uh, spatial practice could be understood as a much broader phenomena in a way. And therefore, Experiments Platform expands that architectural field, combining it with um, multidisciplinary practices and theories. And really, the best part of it is that um, what Martina has already mentioned, too, is that um, participants are going to have a chance to discuss their ideas uh, with mentors, to really receive that feedback and support regarding their research ideas and uh, topics and, uh, you know, any spatial practice methods, um, as well as they will also be able to share their experiences with other members of the program and uh, refine the project together. So it will kind of become, a, it, it will become a community in a way that contains many different experiments and um, together with that it contains many curious and initiative people on board. And today I'm delighted to present to you our very first discussion um, about the experimentation on architecture. Um, it shall be a great opportunity for all of you to learn about the mentors and their perspectives. And um, they are going to be uh, first mentors for this experience platform. So this is a great opportunity for all of you to hear and see them in this live discussion, as well as also have an opportunity to ask a few questions at the end of the talk. So um, I'm happy to present today um, our lovely Anna Kubelik, uh, architect and artist uh, who graduated from Architectural Association in London before pursuing an artistic and experimental career with a base in Berlin. And her projects are defined by a collaborative processes with uh, which intertwine with scientific teams, uh, with dance, music, and installations with a kinetic art. So here we also have um, Xenia Adiobe, an architect, uh, founder of Nicola Lenivet's uh, classroom, who is also a director of Adiobe's Scott Whitby Studio, and who also leads projects in education and culture, and she creates research and educational um, education on new rural, um, how collective uh, art sustains communities and new labor economies um, and the natural resources of the future. Uh, we also have on board Michou Nanon de Bruin, uh, who is a senior designer at the studio Makink and Bay, who is also a teacher at the master inside of uh, Key ABK and Academy of Architecture, uh, who also works in different domains of applied art, where her interest lies, lies in, in the relation between uh, the private and public domain. And her critical, uh, critical research leads to project um, interior exhibition designs and future care visions and projects um, and events in the public domain. Uh, Together with that, I'm happy to present Jürgen Bay, who is a renowned uh, art designer and also a founder of Studio McKink and Bay, who is the director of Sandberg Institute since 2010, uh, which looks for a way to align studies with the dynamic of uh, modern day culture and um, issues of contemporary society, such as vacancy, art and political spatial design. And uh, last but not least, we also have James Tyler Foster, uh, who is a writer and a cultural critic trained in architecture. Um, he is a curator of contemporary architecture and design and Arkdesk, uh, the Swedish Center for Architecture and Design. And in 2016, he co-curated the Nordic Pavilion at the 15 Biennale Architektur in Venice. And in 2018, he participated in Central Exhibition at the 16th. Uh, he has developed a number of curatorial projects in Stockholm, including most recently the first museum exhibition to explore the culture and creative uh, field of ASMR. And he was formerly editor at large for Art Daily. Um, so yeah, we really have a great team in here and um, I'm just very happy to you know, be in this all together with all of you. Uh, so very, 
congratulations uh, for you know starting all of it and being in here and i believe that you know this experiment uh, experience platform will be really a celebration of creativity and uh think creative thinking and thinking out of the box and really kind of being not afraid to experiment and test something that hasn't been resolved before maybe <laughs> so yeah um well i can see that we are still missing a few mentors and I'm not sure whether we should start a discussion yet or shall we wait, but I, I think we could really start with, with it. So because the time is passing and you know, what do you think Martinez? <laughs> yes, as far as I know, James uh, will not be able to join us yeah. today, but uh, we haven't received anything from Shu and Jurgen. <laughs> so. Yeah. I confess that I also got the time confused because I didn't realize that uh, Lithuania was in a different time zone. So perhaps they didn't realize either, which would be totally understandable. <laughs> yeah, I see the confusion, especially the, the fact that most of the countries recently changed their timing for the summer time. Um, well, yeah. Well, I believe that we could still um, continue talking and um, maybe starting with the first question because I believe that uh, Anna and Xenia has a lot of things to say and I think it would be valuable to uh, just not wait but really uh, keep talking. <laughs> so uh, I would like to really first with uh, uh, to, to start with the first question for the discussion, which is more of the personal question. So uh, tell us a little bit about your experience and what topics have you been investigating in your personal practice in the last years and what interests you currently? <laughs> Anna, maybe you would like to start. Um, sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me for this um, experiments platform. I'm really looking forward to um, meeting everyone, uh, all the participants, mentors, as well as um, all uh, applicants and interested uh, students, or I don't want to call them students, but more like creators or uh, to create like this laboratory situation. I have to, first of all, excuse me uh, myself, if you can hear sound, it's because I'm in a sound studio and someone next door is still working on a, on a sound piece that is repetitive. So I hope it will just be a nice background sound, not too annoying. Um, yeah, that also drops me straight into the, uh, to the question of my experience. I am in a sound studio at the moment because I've been working on sound for a film which is uh, part of an exhibition that is currently showing in Berlin. Um, unfortunately, probably most of you won't be able to see it. So that's why I took a lot of effort to make a film of the exhibition to get as close as to an experiential um, experience as possible. Uh, it's unfortunately the only media we can all use from all over the world currently with our limitation of traveling. So I think that's probably also a very important media that uh, has become more important for, for these days for communication. Um, saying that, that's just a part of a tool that I use for communicating my work. Um, I use film in order to yeah, let everyone experience as much as possible what I, I'm, I'm interested in, which is um, this hybrid between art and science. Um, I think having an architectural education really helps for crossing that link between science and art, because as an architect, you really have this tool to learn very um, generalistically uh, many different fields and try to bring them together. Um, what I'm fascinated with science is um, to set up a, a theory and then trying to prove it through uh, a, a whole set of experiments um, that require, first of all, uh, a structure to set up as an experiment, but also observation skills, documentation skills, um, and all of that, I, um, in my practice at least, uh, leads into some kind of artistic expression. But it comes from this very logical um, foundation of, of, of trying to follow up with a theory and then experimenting with it and following that scientific sort of narrative. 
Um, currently, I've been working on this show that I just mentioned. It's um, a lot to do with immateriality, immateriality of, uh, of climate, of humidity, of temperature, and of sound, and trying to somehow manifest that. And that is manifested in a sculpture that measures um, temperature and especially relative humidity, relative humidity. Um, and it's accompanied by a sound performance with Oliver Schmidt, uh, who is a sound, um, sound artist and drummer um, based in Berlin and in Zurich. Um, for me, collaboration is a very important aspect of, of, of um, a, a process, but also of a, a resulting piece, because it just enters more facets like everyone has a speciality everyone knows something has been studying something and i'm interested in in those things that i don't know about so anything from science to uh, music uh, i know a lot about music but again in this architectural point of view very generalistically i don't know how to play the piano i don't know how to drum so uh, i don't know how to move in space uh, through choreography although i know about it so it's kind of interesting for me to work with people who are really specialists in those fields and can interpret my work and and add that extra layer uh into the work that makes it uh more experiential uh, and experimental. And um, that always results in some kind of performative installation. Um, currently, I'm also, um, so this is work that has been going on since 2013, um, the Well-Tempered Hygrometer. You can already see part one and two on my website. Part three is now in this exhibition. Um, and who's interested in to see that result, they're happy to contact me to add them to the, my newsletter, then I can show what, what I'm currently showing in Berlin. And um, more recently, I've been also looking at uh, two um, other immaterial uh, things. One is uh, solar uh, energy. Uh, I'm very fascinated now at the moment with, um, with uh, the question of uh, how, we are going to solve a lot of problems, which we can talk about later, but um, I'm looking at uh, specifically uh, solar energy, solar panels, and also the plastic problem. That's maybe more material problem. Um, I've been collecting my own plastic waste since Corona started, and uh, it's been a very cathartic uh, experience. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's going to result of it, but um, plastic is definitely an issue that I think is worth an architectural tackling as well. So, yeah. Absolutely, it is so lovely to you know listen to all of it, and I think it just really uh, proves that when you can merge uh, science and creativity, it can really lead you to somewhere far and somewhere very exciting. So I believe that if we manage to you know connect those things, um, it would really help us to maybe. Uh, find some solutions, whether it is something for more of the environmental disasters or, or for some uh, social aspects and and things like that. I'm, I'm very fascinated to, to hear all of this. Um, yes, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, Ksenia, would you like to continue with your answer? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Um... I will, uh, but I just wanted to respond very quickly to something that Anna said, if I may, um, because I think it's super interesting, the invitation of the experiments platform to be very free with uh, the proposed project or research that you would like support on. And um, recently I was um, at this event organized by Dazeen, like a virtual event, and uh, there were some presentations talking about the metaverse and how a lot of designers, um, fashion designers, spatial designers, uh, even like people who do performances are creating in the virtual realm. And that whether, whether we like it or not, I mean, for many decades in science fiction, we've been talking about the blending of the real and the virtual. And I think we'll all agree that it's happening. Um, and so something very interesting was said there, that our experience of architecture will soon be 
um, we won't have a distinction between our bodies and the space and the material of the architecture. It will just be one experience through like a choreography of space and and feeling and various um, sense sensations. Um, so for me, the kind of meaning of experimentation, I guess, is to keep kind of making and, and also like talking and reading and listening to people, but keep making to really shift your mind out of current understandings of our disciplines of our um of, of everything really um and yeah i think it's really beautiful the the practice that anna has described and i think uh, those who get her as a mentor will be very lucky <laughs> um but yeah sorry about that um this distracted uh, beginning <laughs> But I'm uh, Xenia, I'm an architect, um, spatial designer, educator. Uh, I'm kind of researcher in the field and in the forest. Um, I lead a very international existence. Actually, I'm a nomad. I live in different places, more or less six months at a time with my son, he's five. We've got a few years left. <laughs> um, and I was born in Moscow, but I grew up in London, uh, started my practice in the UK, did the first project in Cambodia and Southeast Asia, um, completed projects in the UK and Russia, did artists residencies in Italy, um, started was was a part of actually founding a new architecture school in Moscow. And then I started my own research and design uh, center in an art park in the middle of nowhere. Um, that's Nikola Lenovet's art park that Augusta referred to at the beginning. Um, and I did that, I think, about five years ago. Um, so, yeah, and I just only lived in mega cities before that. And I moved to a village which had about uh, 10 houses, I think. <laughs> and um yeah and i just started inviting lots of clever people and young people to join us in trying to figure out what the countryside is and what would be its future and how we can use it as an inspiration a resource and as a um as a rich um ground really that supplies you with a lot of knowledges um a lot of existing technologies and uh, it's surprising how that's suddenly become quite current. <laughs> and um, obviously, Rem Koolhaas' exhibition, uh, Countryside, The Future, happened last year. But of course, many, many people have been working on these themes for many years. And now, um, and now I'm really yeah, interested in forestry and the timber industries, in uh, also, we're doing a lot of work with uh, Latin America. Um, and yeah, I, I suppose my current interest is in kind of um, the rural, but in particular in forests and trees as a natural resource of the future. And by that I mean like there's like oil and gas, but like of the future, they're going to be forests and water. So like oxygen and fresh water and arable land and soil are obviously going to be the scarce resources of the future. So in, in particular, forest and trees and um, how forests are sensors and self-governing systems um, and how humanity through science and through mythology has always been um, obsessed with using the forest as, as a systemic analogy or um, as a kind of place a spiritual place. Um, the forest is a very important um, provider of knowledges, but also a challenger of uh, perhaps contemporary knowledges. And then, of course, timber as a construction um, materials and technology. And then, of course, ecosystem changes how we're um, damaging uh, the planet through deforestation, what we can do through reforestation. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. So all these things. Um, so we're actually doing a summer course uh, about the forest, the Amazon forest, but at a very specific uh, location on all of these themes. So if you'd like to join us, yeah, you can. <laughs> um, yeah, but the other thing, and I suppose the reason I'm here is because I've done a lot of educational stuff through the uh, research center that I established in the art park. And I think education is like the, I mean, it's the most tra uh, fast transforming um, industry or sphere field uh, at the moment. And education has become free, accessible. Uh, why would we need universities in the future? I think um, is the question on everyone's lips. And how do we shape or how, how, how do we give young people the support and the tools to create the professions for the future? Uh, so we involve um, young people in live projects uh, in the art park uh, and through a new project, actually, where we're linking cultural parks across the globe. Uh, between uh, location in Italy, where I've just been in Sicily, um, Nigeria, Venezuela, New Zealand, uh, and I'm sure there's a few I've forgotten. <laughs> so we're creating this kind of like network for education through life projects, through um, social re-engineering, through building using recycled materials and uh, recycled um, uh, construction elements, etc. Um, yeah, so I'm quite interested in basically taking education outside. Um, I suppose like I've done in my life, just go outside into the forest or into the industrial polygon and learn what you can do through experimentation. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Xenia. I think what you also mentioned is something that is very valuable to reconsider these days. You know, that's that distinction between the urban and the forest, really. And what is it the, so that the forest as a, as a you know, natural um, being uh, is actually very um, based uh, by you know different infrastructures that are not necessarily that visible and uh, you know where we can find that juxtaposition between the urban and the forest and what is the purpose and what is the meaning of the urban for the future as we can see you know in our lives in current days uh, being just swifted uh, from the from the you know um, the 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 things that happened after after the pandemic reached us you know this whole concept of the living really uh kind of hit us all to rethink our our you know habits and and what it is really to live in the urban place or or is it actually a matter of you know understanding the forest now and yeah all of these questions are very very uh, inspirational and um, very needed to think through. Um, thank you very much, Xenia. And uh, <laughs> it's very lovely to see that uh, Mishu also joined us. And I would be really happy to, pr to present. Hello. <laughs> um, very happy that you are here. And uh, well, I started the discussion with a question. Uh, uh, to really tell us a little bit about yourself and about your personal experience and you know the topics that you've been investigating in your personal practice uh, you know recent years and you know your interests uh, are really interesting to hear for us so uh, hello Michu and uh, please I'm giving you a space to talk. Hi, hi. I'm uh, Michu de Brown. I'm, uh, we are in a, I work for Studio Marking and Bay. We are located in uh, Rotterdam, but I'm original from the rural areas from Switzerland, from farm area. And uh, I also own forest. So hello, Xenia. <laughs> I own a 0 0.7 hectare forest in, in Holland. <laughs> so I'm also quite a lot there. Uh, but maybe more about, uh, um, 
what we do in the studio, I think I, it's very difficult always to explain because we do quite a lot. Um, and this is the question of what we do now. So I thought I, I show you. <laughs> so I'm gonna sh share a screen if it works. Uh, it doesn't work. I think somebody has to allow me. Yes, just a second. Yeah. Um, but should be able to share. Hmm. Otherwise, I'll just talk. <laughs> can, you, can you try again? You should be able to, to share. Yeah, no, it's not. Uh, it's not allowed, you know? Yeah. Just one more thing I'll. I can try what happens. Do you see everything now? Mm -hmm. Do you see something? Unfortunately not. No. So I think we, we just don't do it. Then we uh, are just going to talk. <laughs> That's also good. Well, um, yeah, we have a really broad field in, in what we are uh, doing in the studio and you will later hear Jurgen also, but in generally it's from product design, furniture design, space design, which is interiors, uh, which is theaters, private spaces, workspaces. Uh, we are uh, interest, very much interested in education in uh, um, we are uh, teaching a lot, but also we see uh, the future of education. We have a project called the Water School where we look what's the uh, elementary school of the future uh, with the questions of today's uh, um, urgency and, and, and changing and keeping our planet healthy. Um, and we ha are the uh, creators of uh, the I IRBR exhibition, that's the International Architectural Biennale uh, in Rotterdam this year. So it's also with the theme of water, the future of water, water is a leverage. Uh, we do a lot of design research, which is actually something I'm personally uh, busy with the last few years, where one of my main topics is the care, the future of care, uh, the future of the demographic changes uh, of the society, and also how we can deal with this. Um, I really am liking to test. I'm also liking to find out and, and in small uh, outside <laughs> uh, uh, experiments, what we what happens when we do what we currently I follow people in the city, which means I follow the cleaners, I follow walk with them. It's called a research project, which is called this walking plan. So I'm walking with uh, the yeah city cleanings, the the city. Um, a forest person, a care person. I don't know what the word is in English. Sorry, the um, the uh, uh, yeah, as a director of art, city art, public art, uh, a director. Uh, oh yeah, a ship company, a ship which is goes through the city. We are in Harbor City in Rotterdam. Um, we've yeah, a, a city drawer, uh, a poet city poet and we walk alongside their work paths, their work actions. Um, so another project of mine, maybe it's making more clear is like, um, I'm very interested in, I believe everything is connected to why we do some things. And I believe therefore, when we are asked to do an interior for a care facility, for example, it's not the making interior itself, the action to do so is also part of the design. So we try to make a very nice interior for them, but at the same time, we try to make it in a way that this could be uh, relevant also for the people living there. So their, the impact is in a different way. So for example, we painted the walls with the acrobat. So they painted the walls with the feet. Uh, we um, draw, uh, yeah, we let actually always be the color choices uh, uh, in debate of everyone who lived there and ex entered an exit. 
and this all was in a sense of how to it was a test of how to build in in care with care uh, locations but also how to build that we that it's not built by institution but by people by surrounding and by families and, and neighborhoods so normally in care institutions here in holland uh, when then it's like a job to do uh, you, it gets outsourced far away, mostly from the location. We try to uh, get every work as close to possible to the location in order to get a community starting, which is less about care, but more about work and joy. And therefore, uh, this is a little bit the area where I'm searching a lot, how we can combine people and how we can activate, uh, in a sense, a location. But therefore, as also now, it's more in a research space and abstract space. But it's yeah, uh, maybe <laughs> what else can I say? We also think a lot in landscapes. So, for example, we have uh, uh, designed a product for Nuria in, in in China, where we made the furnishings for houses. It's very interesting. Now, for market uh, from between thirty and thirty-five years, was the people who wanted to buy that they wanted us to produce. For, it's a very limited age group, uh, but at that point, it's the realization: if you use a certain material, you also create a landscape. Meaning, if you use a leather, it means you have to have cows. If you use and by cows, they eat certain things. So you need those grains. Uh, you want to use a certain kind of wood, means, means there in China somewhere. We want to plant these trees. So we, do we like these trees? And therefore, everything you make is connected to a, a network, and a network of people and a network of materials in the landscape. I think that's how far I can go. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's really amazing, uh, Mishu. Thank you very much. I think, again, it's just uh, really exciting to understand how we all could just really roll up your our hands and just, you know, be there hands on on the project to experience the place to kind of, you know, live in the space and, and you know, approach uh, that is happening around us. And I also love the idea of the community and and um, you know, that aim to kind of work uh, from kind of bottom up to create communities that could also you know, have you know, big discussions together to create something uh, you know, together. Uh, this is really lovely. Um, I also uh, see that um, Jürgen joined us today. Um, thank you, Michu, again for uh, such a lovely um, talk. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, Jürgen, uh, can you hear us? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Can you hear Hello. me? Hello. Yes. Hello. Okay, okay. Hello. Very lovely to see you. Um, so here we are in the discussion and currently we're answering this, you know, personal question about your uh, topics that you've been investigating in your recent years and what you what are your interests in your practice and just really tell us about yourself we would love to hear more about you yeah. well um, i graduated on uh, product design public space in uh, eindhoven so i'm trained to be a designer and uh, through the uh, studio, we developed ourselves uh, more and more into uh, the landscape, but then always starting with a small scale. So the interest is, um, as a product designer, could you get involved with uh, architecture? And um, uh, I, I've always said that I would prefer to be a designer scale one to 100, because on one hand, I love reality for its um, strangeness and unlogicality uh, but on the other hand uh, i also find it hard because when you deal with reality you also have to deal with the people that uh, oppose what you want and the beauty of uh, scale one to a hundred is that no one talks against you so they all <laughs> all your models will just grow the way you want it so you have like a a full freedom and I also expect a little bit that um, when you are a writer a fiction writer that it's basically like that you construct uh, a sort of a surrounding a basics and then you develop characters 
and then you make your characters live in that space and through living they slowly develop their own worlds uh, and and the beauty of that is that everyone that reads it sees exactly what has been written but the reality is just some letters and uh, and the beauty of that is also that everyone will read what they expect so if you have no knowledge you can't see it and that's also like um, uh, there is like research for instance by um, uh, the people that always lived in the, um, the rainforest that had never seen any other uh, civilization and when they were brought for instance to new york they would think that these people would go crazy because getting into a city with all the cars and the uh, high rise and things like that uh, and never been uh, out of there but the beauty is that your mind can only see what it can cope so when it goes in the city it will see wheels as it knows but also the nature that it sees so instead of like freaking out by seeing the unexpected your eyes can only see what you are aware of so i think that's a that's a strong force and that is also the beauty of uh, thinking and models and uh, as um, Ishu said that our interest is the landscape so things are never independent and of course we come from an era where you first had to do city planning or urban planning then architecture then interior architecture then products and then uh, people uh, making it into their culture so in architecture you still see all those um, signs of like how the house is going to be and then the promised land is that when this is built you will develop a culture and then you will live really nicely after and and i think it's nice to start from the other side that you just start with the development of the culture and then through that uh, develop um, uh, your kind of reality and that's also why uh, movies as um, um, uh, dogville uh, last one three also shows that that's a, a movie that's really close to a book like hardly anything uh, exists in their surrounding and yet you get fully moved uh, by the players and and it becomes like a, a hyper reality you never question whether it's true or not true although uh, a house is just built by a cabinet or just by three uh, chairs behind each other and then it becomes a church and it's also like the first city that is really see-through so it's, you could almost say like uh, already in advance of social media it existed that you could see everyone at the same time and and of course it's like it comes from a movie but then on the other hand if you look at where we are now then the question is what is our reality and i think like a series as uh, Black Mirror also shows it that there is a science fiction in its head and yet you step in it and you're still fully surprised how far and how close it is for reality and that's also where I feel that culture uh, could become like the ultimate force right now since the gravity of reality has like sort of lost or has to find itself like it's like going to the moon but then on the world itself. So the question is, what do we need if we want to change our surrounding? Is it our behavior? Is it our language? And those are examples where I also feel that if you go to very busy areas as a station, then you could think of like doing engineer counting of how much people can you send through it? And how fast can they move and how will they not be obstructed by each other? And that's like the engineering. But you could also raise the question, should you not investigate places like that by dancers? Because dancers do not only count, they also know when certain feet are on the ground, there are certain movements you will never make. You also know who you look in the eye, who you can touch, who you can pass by from back or from front. It's like this kind of like human knowledge that goes with it. So the question is, are we going to be followed by engineering or are we going to be followed by culture and language? And I think at the moment, and you see it also with the pandemic, that culture and the way we move is much more important. And it is seeing, of course, all the bad things that come from it. The nice thing is that if you now go to a shop, people move completely different. They don't stand in front of things really long because they are aware other people are in that shop also. 
which I think is a starting point of like going to a, um, a, like a, a landscape that's much more filled by people and are able to still live with each other under those conditions. So in that sense, I do think they're very uh, interesting times and, and you can question who rules what. Like in the old days, you would say if there's a car, it had a big nose and you would go through the landscape and enjoy the landscape. But now with all the walls around the highways and we're almost only looking still at our navigator as a way of like moving from one place to another. There's hardly any landscape that passes by unless our navigation system would be done by um, uh, animators. So you could imagine that like, who rules our landscape outside? Is it the, um, uh, um, the landscaper, or could be, or, or could it be an animator that makes us move from one place to another and and uh, develops what we can see, but also how we would behave? So I think in that sense, uh, our uh, different disciplines that used to be uh, hierarchic from top to bottom, from big scale to small scale. For the first time, I think we're like, uh, we could do all the same assignments from a totally different uh, perspective and discipline. Uh, and in that sense, I think it's quite interesting because it becomes much more like a parallel universe in which everyone can work at the same time with the same means and the same possibilities, developing, um, uh, well, let's call it the new city. And that's why I think the scale one to hundred, which is close enough to reality to be able to uh, imagine it and far enough to get obstructed by um, all these daily life situations that make it hard to come to decisions. Well, thank you very much for such an, um, such an interesting uh, insight. And I think what I was thinking really of, you know, that those different layers that, you know, every human being have uh, has accordingly to their, you know, cultural backgrounds and, you know, perceptions and, you know, the things that we're being, that, you know, we all are in the same planes, but we actually see very different things um, that, um, you know, directly reflects our, you know, uh, worldview in a way. And I think it's such an interesting thought of, you know, uh, cultural aspect that could be considered as an architecture in a way. And, you know, <laughs> I think this is a very, very strong statement. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and I'm very happy to see that uh, James joins us. Um, and uh, we are all us here so um we're really glad that you made it and you could join us and i think it's just a, a perfect opportunity and and the time for you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your interests and you know what topics you've been investigating in your recent recent years and um you know what what interests you currently hi again <laughs> Of course. I mean, firstly, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm late. It's like my schedule has just been a complete chaotic disaster. Um, but I'm, I managed to get to the last thing quicker. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I was diving into a very interesting conversation, which um, I hope I'm not sort of um, stopping. But but my name is James and, and I'm um, First and foremost, the curator of contemporary architecture and design at, uh, at Arkdes, which is the Swedish National Museum of Architecture and Design. And I'm an architect by training, uh, but that evolved into writing and editing and eventually into curatorial work. To me, everything is under the sort of headline of architecture with a capital A and this sort of ambiguous moving thing, which, you know, I, I suppose what my practice has, has been about is making things public. And making things public is a, is a very charged activity and especially within the fields of architecture and design. But that is, that is the sort of overarching thing. My, my research uh, centers on much more interesting sort of, for me at least, liminal uh, things, um, such as how one engages with a discourse like architecture, for, for instance, which is so defined, um, so heavy, so nationalistically characterized, um, and bring in questions of 
gay sex and cruising culture into those debates or um, to try to legitimize emerging internet communities and cultures like ASMR uh, into these discourses. Because by, by looking at, I think, um, extremely contemporary questions, again, contemporary being a very loaded word, I think there's all sorts of connections that can be teased out from, from other kinds of fields and disciplines. So I suppose that's in, a, in brief, like what I do and what I'm interested in, and it's an overwhelming thing because you know, when, you, when you're involved in the contemporary, as I guess most of us are in, in, in this context, um, there's always something new, right? So essentially curiosity underpins that sort of practice. Um, in the long term, I don't know whether museums will exist in the way that we know them, even in the near future. Um, curatorial practice, of course, like, I mean, legitimately, I'm probably one of only 10 curators of architecture and design that actually are attached to an institution in the world. So that's also a dying breed. Um, I think there's a massive moment of reformation within culture more broadly. And that's what I'm interested in, in exploring from within an institution right now, but who knows what the future brings. Thank you very much, James, and we're really happy to have you here. And I mean, just an, as an overall, we can really see that, you know, architecture uh, brings together so many different aspects and, and you know, topics. Um, yeah. I think it's really because, you know, our architecture surrounds us and, and you know, environment and, and people and communities surround, uh, you know, architecture. And I think we're just really, you know, we can really easily lose our minds by really trying to find any, you know, limit limitations or any sort of, you know, features that could really perfectly explain this, you know, architecture and design. And uh, uh, it's kind of becoming very relative, very re relative actually, <laughs> kind of being. Um, it's really interesting and um, yeah I would really love to continue our discussion moving to another question and well it is really about the architecture and can architecture exist on its own and how is architecture surrounded by the rest of the world and you know how you how you really see that discipline and you know the meaning of it maybe so maybe Michou maybe you would like to start with with the with this Yes, of course. Yeah, I, I think uh, what we always underestimate is that architecture is much broader and will, and we always need to, in the field of design and architect, we always have to reinvent ourselves. So I have the feeling this is not only architecture has to move, but our dis discipline is constantly in reinvention. So it's... Uh, you have that's why experiment is so important well we have to find out which ways we have to go and they're not only can be driven by economics but they also have to be driven by experiment knowledge you build with it and where you go so yeah as you hear before everything is a network for me clearly architecture is not uh, it's it's a part in the web and therefore it's for sure not alone it has, uh, I think, the brick which we use to build the building, for example, or how we make that brick uh, is as important and is as much making architecture as the shaping of a building and also who we employ. And so I think that the whole question is very big. Yes, absolutely. It is, it is very big and very kind of uncertain in a way and maybe we don't need really to make it certain <laughs> so maybe maybe Anna you would like to continue on that <laughs> yeah I think uh, I, I just have to sort of piggyback on Michou a little bit and uh, and agree with her uh, totally on on the questions of um, of you know there is no barrier of, of architecture in the literal sense of a wall or or something that defines maybe just simply a building um, I think uh, there's so much more broader also uh, Jürgen touched upon the fact that uh, there's so many scales um, as an architect you have this amazing opportunity um, in your education to start 
realizing you can be a landscape art architect or an urban planner, or you go more into detail of a, you know, a certain big public buildings uh, up to a house, up to a piece of furniture. Um, it really goes into, into all these scales. And I think uh, what's interesting is um, historically architects used to be like everything. They used to be an engineer and an artist, and they were sort of this all rounder. Um, they had much more um, sort of overall uh, generalistic, but also very specialized um, capabilities, and they had to do pretty much everything. Um, and now, thing you know, where the world has become more complex. Um, there's definitely a lot of problems that we have to tackle uh, from overpopulation. Uh, we've I think turned from 2 billion over just a hundred years to 8 billion people on the planet, which I think is something really interesting. Like how are they going to live? Where are they going to live? Um, that already alone is the architectural question, um, let alone also the question of energy and, and these things. So the architecture itself goes beyond this question of, uh, of a, of a building envelope. Um, I think all these problems that we're, we're facing uh, that we have to really tackle as architects, uh, as many other professions do as well, um, you have to sort of go into that field with maybe just the architectural education, but that's pretty much because you, you have a lot of, uh, a whole set of tools that you can use in order to tackle these problems and, um, and solve them. And then architecture, uh, this experiments platform is exactly perfect to, to start thinking about how to experiment maybe on a, in a very methodical way. Um, and also to fail, to have this sort of space to fail. I, even though I don't like the word failure because failure has never actually been a failure. If you look at scientific uh, experiments, a lot of these so-called failures turned into the most uh, world turning um, you know, um, discoveries. So I think that's the potential that lies in, in experiment and, and the potential within the architecture, the architectural field, as broad as it can be understood. Absolutely. And, you know, the things that you mentioned that it kind of can come into the sort of discipline that you find, or, you know, uh, the way of, of, of thinking and experimenting I mean, this is why we're all here as well to really experiment and to understand that integration of, of everything that surrounds us um, is as, as much as important as, as the architecture itself. Um, Xenia, would you like to um, give a word? <laughs> if you're ready, of course. Yeah, sure. Sorry, I just lost you for a second there. Um, really fascinating uh, to hear all of the other mentors, by the way. I um, feel very humbled and honoured to be with you guys and hopefully we'll get a chance to speak <laughs> somehow, <laughs> share some more screen time. Um, yeah, so architecture, I mean, your question was also how is it related to everything else? And I guess that's more my interest. Um, so uh, we started a project recently in New York. Um, I'm gonna be Fulbright visiting scholar at the Pratt Institute uh, very shortly, which is extremely exciting, but obviously I had to um, kind of try and get a head, head start on that. And we've been working with this amazing artist called uh, Marin Agarwal. And uh, she has a project called Field, and it's about grass. And um, grass has a very interesting history because it's been imported and exported uh, back and forth. And it's kind of an emblem of colonialism in, in many respects. And um, I mean, this question is a bit of a rabbit hole because you could just go on <laughs> different directions. But for example, when you specify grass, um, you, you're immediately tied into like a cosmology of like histories and of like 
the meanings of um, that every that every material carries. So how can architecture not be connected with everything else? Um, but anyway, in this particular project, we're working with an artist, um, an amazing Indian New York based artist, and her research has recently been into grass. And so she invited us, uh, me and my colleague Alejandro Hayek, and a material scientist, um, Jill uh, Barenbaum, and an architect, and Annie Gonzalez, um, to make a new material out of grass clippings and to design a structure and also to do like a mapping of uh, of needs and some of the histories um, specifically in the place where we're placing this pavilion and the pavilion is is part of the um, climate provocations exhibition on governor's island um so it's kind of about the the ephemerality of architecture and the um um the temporality of architecture but but i think what's more interesting has been that so we've been working with this material scientist to design a new material which doesn't exist while we're designing the architecture and that's like the future i mean <laughs> because we have the possibility now to work like this to work so seamlessly between disciplines and speaking to so many different specialists and inventors almost um, simultaneously as architecture is being thought up um, so yes it's all connected <laughs> uh, yeah and I, I guess just very very briefly the other project I wanted to cite which I mentioned previously is the Sol y Sombra uh, research project, uh, which this year is going to be about human movement um, from shadow policies to shadow ecologies. And that has come out of the research we did through a summer course last year, um, which was about migration. And we realized that there's a massive link between migration and ecosystems and ecosystem services that are provided to people as they walk. And it seems so obvious but we just, um, again, it's about like going out into the field often and looking at things that are very um, real. And it's a real challenge, I think, for, for architects of, the, of yesteryear to situate their projects in such a uh, experiential um, first-hand reality but yet human movement has been shaping ecosystems for uh, centuries and uh, we must be looking at these things in the same kind of deep analysis even more now um, with the current challenges that we're facing definitely it, it kind of you know give gives me this idea that you know architecture can bring us into this you know, those very different disciplines of something, you know, not necessarily material, something inventive, something, you know, some sort of discovery type of thing. And, you know, uh, I think it is also really a celebration of, you know, um, ability to exchange your minds and, and you know, discuss and, and talk. And that's something that already creates a part of you know, that type of architecture in a way. Um, yes, um, James, would you like to uh, express your uh, point of view? <laughs> I mean, lots of very important points that I that I hold with have already been made. But I mean, just to return to the, the idea of in, in the context of, I think, experimentation, failure, mentoring and being a mentee you know there is this kind of important acknowledgement that that i made a little bit too late still fortunately soon enough which is that you know if you are studying architecture you can do anything with that right it's a way of thinking it's a an architecture is ultimately just communication anyway 
um, in the form of drawing or in the form of verbalizing, in the form of synthesizing ideas and contexts. And I think that's a really important thing to acknowledge and remember. I mean, that's how I'm landed in this kind of slightly odd outcast position that I'm in. But, but I find if, I mean, granted, there needs to be architects who built. Um, and, but in the context of, of architecture and design and something that you mentioned earlier, you know, it is backgrounded. And the fact that it's backgrounded, the fact that we, we exist within rooms and we know them so well, the fact that we engage with design, you know, we have almost a thousand encounters a day, if not more, means that it's extremely difficult to, to sort of pass through the, the significance of individual moments or the potential of architecture and design. Uh, architecture and media is completely focused on, on you know, outstanding projects. Um, but I'm interested in, in sort of mundanity as well, you know, the ordinary and how the ordinary affects and, and increases um, what it means to be human, what it means to be in, in a society, what it means to be collective. And, and I think all these questions are becoming more and more prescient as a result of the last year. Um, but at the same time, you know, being able to, to think contextually and think curatorially are... are skills that are already that many people already have and um, they just might not be practiced in the in the most visible way absolutely and i mean uh well this really you know gives a, a kind of a ground to, to it of you know the way of understanding um and uh Yes, thank you very much, James. And Jurgen, would you like to continue? Uh, sorry, did you want? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yes, please, Jurgen, continue. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I think we're all like coming from a different uh, angle, and, and I completely agree that uh, education is not like what you have to become. So if you study architecture, then it's the culture of architecture, and there's like many different things you can do. And it's the same with. Uh, um, studying arts and I'm still waiting for the first artist to become like a banker and a proper banker like ruling the bank because I'm sure that uh, banks will not act as they uh, act right now if we have directors that have an art education and then every, most of the time it's the opposite and they first start these so-called very functional uh, uh, professions and then and then uh, when they're like uh, uh, later they think that uh, may maybe they could better act as an artist and then they become artists but i would rather go for the other way around and also feel that we have that responsibility i feel that uh, within the art field we have much too long always thought if it comes to politics if it comes to edu uh, if it comes to um, um, uh, economics uh, or uh, laws, then we always tend to think, uh, let that be done uh, by others because they know better. And that's exactly what's happening right now that the art field is like so small and in a very specific corner because they didn't take those responsibilities. I think it's, it is really important that uh, your education is just a culture of being. And from there you start like developing uh, your reality. And, mm -hmm. As a product designer, I think for me, it's, it's like if you talk about experiments and uh, being able to uh, act, uh, uh, let's say, on the edge of uh, architects, then um, uh, you could say that uh, designing exhibitions is one chance where you build the um, uh, architecture within architecture, which means that there's a lot of freedom there. But you can also say, when architecture gets built, there is a long lasting period where there's a lot of experiments possible with the materials, the building, the way things get organized, the way you develop a culture. Now, most of the time, it's just a fence that then gets a, like, a nice art print instead of like using this whole development of the building as one big example of where you are able to, I wouldn't even call it experiment, it's rather like, the in-between space that can be used for all kind of like um, either by materials, either by behavior. So I think there's a lot of um, uh, possibilities uh, still hardly used, I would think, to uh, develop this, uh, what we would call like a final uh, position. 
So, and it's the same with the industry. You see now more and more uh, the industry gets involved so that the building areas can be done much cleaner. Uh, under, and also the work can be done under good circumstances, which raises then a question of, uh, again, like how would the working space look like? How does that landscape? Can you imagine yourself in the morning choosing either for the beach or your work spot because it's such an interesting landscape so i feel that um uh yeah it depends from which from which background you come uh what, how you would get involved in architecture absolutely and i think just kind of as a summary of of you know this uh architectural type of uh, topic, type of discussion. I, I really like to just repeat one of the quote that um, uh, James said, it is kind of the, you know, architecture sort of a synthesis of the ideas and the con concepts. And I think that's, you know, a, a very, you know, beautiful way of, you know, thinking about it. Um, okay, well, very lovely to hear everything, uh, all of your ideas. Um, and now I just think that uh, maybe we should uh, head to the Q&A session. And uh, with that having said, I would ask you, Martinez, whether we have you know, any questions that have been asked by any uh, listeners um, so that we could answer them. <laughs> uh, no, unfortunately, uh, we we are broadcasting our talk uh, on Facebook, and there's uh, around 30 people watching us, but no questions from the audience. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't know if uh, you would like to ask maybe one another a question that uh, yeah interests you about your practice uh, or or because I find already here are some links for example what Mishu and Jurgen are doing uh, it for me it, it really resembles what Xenia is also talking about about this kind of culture and how culture shapes the, the environment yes absolutely um, I'm, I'm gonna take a moment and just you know tell everyone uh, that if you have anything in your minds uh, you can still you know make your uh, uh, write your questions in, in the comments and maybe we'll be able to answer them and meanwhile I think what I really still want to kind of um, shortly discuss about is really you know that celebration of the experimentation which is why we're here for so maybe if like all of you uh, could kind of express what do you think we should really celebrate uh, in this experiments platform um, as a, you know, concept of experimentation in architecture, uh, maybe half a minute or, or a minute uh, long uh, statement, <laughs> if you could all, you know, uh, give your thoughts on that. So maybe, maybe Jürgen, you would like to start with that. <laughs> uh, can I like uh, be not the first one? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, uh, James, would you like to uh, give us your ideas? <laughs> uh, sure. Like um, the the question that you're asking is 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 what should we celebrate about experimentation? And I think the the answer is sort of in the question in a little bit. I mean, I think experimentation is important because it's so diverse and unexpected, and it's I think that's also part of the point of even going into something, right? You don't quite know necessarily what the answer is when you when you start. Um, that is something that is far too less, that's far too little of, right? I mean, there's, a, there's such uh, pressure and such fear and anxiety around performing and delivering and fitting into to sort of constructs that personally I see less and less experimentation um, in a real way, you know? I see kind of like minor attempts within the field that kind of being daring, but that's pretty much it. So, I mean, I'm not even sure we'll get there in with this project, but maybe in a future iteration of this project, I don't know, because it's something that takes time and, you know, the right kind of um, 
the right kind of supportive framework, I think, in order to, 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 to occur. Maybe we'll achieve that um, now, but I think it's, that would be my statement. <laughs> yes. And I mean, I, I think it's very, uh, it's really great that we're kind of heading there to, you know, give a try and maybe have this, you know, um, perfect way of, you know, experimenting it and, and make it make it real and, and doable and uh, that something come, exciting comes out of it. Um, yes, um, Xenia, would you like to um, tell us your ideas on that? <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, I, I don't think I'm that ready either, <laughs> because, uh, but I'm really intrigued, actually, to find out why, um, why, James, do you say that we don't see real experimentation? <laughs> What's real and what isn't within, <laughs> within, I'm talking in the kind of, in the realm of, of risk taking in a certain, in a certain sense within the field of architecture, I'm absolutely convinced that we are increasingly losing the validity of experimentation in favor of, 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 of a need for recognition. And I think that when I, when I really, people I work with, um, I used to be a, a, you know, an editor for, for a, a a platform that is extremely complicit in in sort of the, the evolution of sort of like the power of the attention economy but really when i when i have students for example i see the most interesting experimental ideas are not the ones that are celebrated are not the ones that are lifted um in the frameworks that let's say allow things to move forward so yeah no I, it's, it's a massive generalized statement i made of course but <laughs> Well, I think it's extremely intriguing because um, with the risk of of kind of in, interpreting what you just said, perhaps in a slightly different way, but there is also increasingly, um, I think, the question of the ethics of aesthetics and the ethics of representation. And it's just that we're in such good company that it makes us feel like experimentation is all around us in the practice of the people that are here. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. And uh, that really um, hit the nail on the head, I think, because in student projects, um, student projects are often a lot braver um, than the projects that those same people end up doing just after they graduate. And that I think is because experimentation is very scary and no one wants to fund it for that same reason. And so it's almost impossible to do unless you have an alternative form of practice um, that's supported, financially supported by other means. Uh, and I guess I came across this analogy that architecture is a bit like an NP complete problem uh, which is impossible to solve uh, mathematically or like near on impossible to solve, but which if you find the solution is very easy to test whether it's correct, whether the solution is correct or not. And um, it's actually kind of very difficult to do if you're, if you're trying to do it in a mathematical or scientific way, but um, so you have to generate it through a multidisciplinary and like complex and artistic and intuitive way. Uh, but we understand that there's nothing complex about testing whether architecture works or not. You just need a five-year-old to go in that building and you'll know 30 seconds in whether that building works or not. Um, so experimentation seems to be the most direct route at achieving to achieving results. Thank you very much, Xenia. Um, um, maybe we should move to uh, Michou. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I think uh, the discussion of experimentation, if there is a lack at this time, I, I don't know. But I think uh, I wish always more abstraction. And I think generally we're moving, I don't know if it's 
in whole Europe, but especially in Holland, to a more organized system, to a more like uh, uh, developed system in, in, in very narrow arrows of what you should fulfill as an architect and what you should fulfill as an art institution. Uh, I, I'm actually more uh, interested in the even opener system than we have now. I'm interested in the narrative and I'm interested in, in the testing and in real time, real time sketching on, on uh, situations. So um, I'm more interested in Xenia's kit going in with color than uh, going in without <laughs> testing the building. So I'm, I'm more interested in what we will build in, instead of what we uh, what now is not good on how we build. I'm think, uh, uh, I think we are in a time where jobs changing through uh, robotics, through electronics, and we are in a situation as creators to create, be part of creating our own job where a lot of people with other jobs are not part and not asked. So I think we have to, uh, through experiment, uh, take a position in what we want to become as an architect or designer, what, we, what our future should be also in our job and where, which questions we want to ask and, and answer. And, um, Therefore, I think the experiment, which is not uh, attached to a direct um, task, in a, in a, like which is self-driven and self, -driven, self uh, uh, for, with own force, uh, I find this very important to have this freedom next to education. And therefore, I also think education is such a powerful uh, uh, thing because we are free of economics. When we create an education, so we are free of, well, we need to have our mom and dad, maybe, <laughs> very good, <laughs> other things, mm -hmm. but we, we are free of, of uh, the, the thinking in, in, in problems. We are, we, we are allowed to make what we think the future should be. And I think this experiment platform uh, has also this freedom and therefore is very valuable. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, I think that education uh, very strongly aligns with the freedom and uh, the freedom to really imagine and uh, imagine without any you know, strong boundaries. Um, Anna, would you like to hear a short statement for us? Um, yeah, I, I'd have to agree with everything that has been said so far. Um, I, I'm currently living in Berlin and um, I think what James said about not being very experimental, I have to see by a day by day, by all the beautifully vast landscapes within the center of the city are being built by investment uh projects and there is so much potential for experimentation that you can see maybe more in scandinavian cities than without being too like generalistic but i can definitely see more experimentation in architecture in other cities than berlin which is very sad considering what the city has as a history and has as a potential so yes, experimentation would be uh, so much needed. Uh, so I'm, I'm really calling from uh, a desperate uh, architectural standpoint from when I look at what's happening in Berlin right now. And, um, and I have to agree with uh, Xenia as well, because it has a lot to do with uh, economics and driven economics. Uh, to have the platform and even the freedom to, to experiment is driven by economical resources and that uh, really frustrates me a lot. Um, I haven't found a real solution for that. Uh, in my own practice, I've just been doing a lot of scholarships, a lot of residency because I experiment with things nobody wants to know about necessarily or, uh, or are necess necessarily in this immediate um, result of you get a result uh, that is economically viable uh, straight away. And because of that, it's really hard to find funding to do things that aren't necessarily in this immediate result of having an economical value of what you've created. And the more uh, Michou is right as well, that this platform is really important to, um, to nurture and enhance uh, experiment 
because um, it will uh, solve a lot of problems. It might also result in a lot of failures, but I think failures are never for nothing. They're always there to get a step further and whatever will result uh, for whoever uh, is joining uh, as a, with their project here in this experiments platform, no matter if these six months result in, um, in a dead end, uh, uh, for now, they might result in something in 10 years uh, into something that suddenly finds a very conclusive uh, result. And therefore it will be never useless. Um, whatever sort of mind path you have to go along and think through till you come to results that will lead you either for, for the moment to a dead end or for a later stage into something that you can really use. Um, so I'm really up for just the challenge of trying something that uh, will hit solid ground or hit a total dead end or hit whatever. Um, I think what is valuable in experimentation, and that's what I use a lot in my own practice, is um, that you do set up some kind of sense of theory or idea that you want to follow. And then you try to think about a way how to sort of prove that idea or a theory. Or you start the other way around, you, you do a material experimentation without knowing where it leads, and then you really go through the experiment of putting different hypotheses on this experiment to understand maybe how, how that could lead into something more tangible. I think, um, so it's important to give the whole experiments idea some kind of structure as well. Um, because even though creativity sounds like this really open thing, it has a sort of system at least I follow a system somehow. And that system is very open and you can always you know, go on a different route uh, when you're following this system. But that system gives you some kind of way to, to, to give you potentially something tangible after this six months. And I think that would be uh, something I would try to guide uh, within the experiments platform. Um, so yeah, having said all that, um, I'm looking forward to whatever will happen. Yes, I'm really looking forward to it too. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, well, Jürgen, would you like to, to wrap up this uh, experimentation celebration here? <laughs> well, well, I'm not sure if I can wrap it up. But I, of course, like uh, the, the, one of the things, of course, is the whole uh, economics that uh, has developed more into an inch insurance company so it means that indeed uh, you feel that like in building it, it it's harder and harder to be explicit uh, or specific because like you want to make sure it fits like a, a broader sense and it and it keeps its value and and apparently if it stays close to the expectations it's a long lasting economical situation which maybe raises also the question like should you um, uh, get involved too much in that or could you get yourself involved in uh, different positions? For instance, maintenance is a thing that is huge and I've never heard anyone discussing the experiment of a broom, whether it moves slightly different than normal. It's like uh, the broom does and, and in between it can do a lot. And it's, I think it's a little bit also, uh, Michu touched a little bit on the project where the painting was done by a dancer. And, the, and one of the main reasons was also that um, you can think about economics, but there are not that many artists that uh, have a 30 euro hour uh, rate and then full time. There are 30 uh, euro hours, but most of the time it's like it dissolves by a month. So there's like one week of 30 euros and then there's like a month of nothing. So that means it diminishes and, and that means that if you are able to get in that world of uh, let's say the normal economics between the 30 and the 50 euro uh, an hour there's a there's a lot of work there to be done and if you are the underlayer as in this painting so you do the underlayer and that goes a layer over that then makes it flat and white it means that there is a lot of space where there are possibilities and they may last not as long uh, as uh, main architect last, 
but I think in, in time lapse, a lot more is possible. It's the same with, same with mowing a grass. You can do it uh, sort of efficient, going up and down, up and down. You can also like ride, and if you ride long enough, it goes down too. So the, I think it's more a matter of like, how are we going to redirect uh, our materials and uh, positions? And then I wouldn't call it uh, experiments. I would rather see it as a culture of behavior uh, and, uh, and a culture of materializing that maybe there is a lot more possible before uh, getting a, uh, like a bigger group of followers that are willing to also live in houses that are built on that kind of thinking. So it's a matter of like, how would you develop a new movement of architecture that used to be like uh, with models and drawings, maybe there's other ways to um, to develop this new world, but that starts always as being accepted as being part of our daily life. So that's even like cleaning windows. There are projects of uh, artists that um, cleaned windows in a complete different uh, setting. And, and therefore it had a, a much bigger uh, cultural um, position. At the, and at the end, the windows were just clean. So the result was exactly the same if you would have hired a company or had done it as an uh, art practice. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jurgen, and thank you all of you um, who uh, just gave us such an amazing insight mm -hmm. on experimenting and architecture and really just telling about yourselves more. And thank you all of you who participated there and who were listening for us. And I think it's a time that we should kind of head to the end of, of it. And um, well, before that, I still want to um, mention that, you know, well, experiments platform, it's, it's only the beginning of that. And I think that already this discussion gave us so many, um, you know, kind of um, inspirations to rethink and reconsider, or maybe to come up on with something that we want to, um, I don't know, elaborate on something or, or just, you know, find a, an idea or a research topic. So I think I really encourage, you know, everyone to rethink and, and apply to this program and you still have some time for it. And we, we really invite all the motivated students and young professionals and enthusiasts. Um, and um, those ideas um, can be presented by individuals or collectives, including up to five people. And in order to apply, uh, you need to formulate a research question uh, that you develop, that you would like to develop further uh, on this program. Um, in the in the that should be presented in the up to two a4 pages and um, also we would like to ask you to include a piece of writing um, a, a statement which is up to 500 words you where you would outline your previous experiences and motivations uh, for the current idea and really the, the rest of information you can also find on Arquitecturas Fondas uh, page two and we're really waiting for your applications. Uh, really send everything in a PDF form uh, to experimente at arcfondas.lt. The deadline is 15 of April, so it's Wednesday. Um, and um, yes, so it's gonna be really, really soon. So I'm really encouraging everyone who hasn't applied yet, please do so. And uh, yes, and uh, you will, get a notice whether your application was successful by the end of April and really if you have any questions please do not hesitate to contact us uh, we're really happy to help you to answer your questions so really text us on experimente at arcfondas.lt and yes it was such a lovely discussion well thank you all all of you who have been there um, Anna, uh, Ksenia, Michu, uh, Jürgen, James, and Martinez. It was a pleasure to be there. And uh, all of you behind your uh, computers and phones. Uh, yes, thank you for being here. <laughs> yes, thank you all. Thank it was you. really a pleasure.
and thank you, Gustav, for moderating, moderating it. Just the uh, last thing uh, I would like to also uh, mention that our great mom and dad who, who provides uh, this uh, financial support is uh, Cultural uh, Lithuanian Council for Culture. So cultural institutions uh, are supported by, by this program. Uh, and yeah, we're happy that uh, we have space and opportunity to be inspired by great mentors so don't hesitate <laughs> write uh, what's on your mind what motivates you and apply for the program so have a nice evening all of you and see you soon yes have a nice evening bye-bye